Adam was habitually late for school. He was frequently disruptive in a low-key sort of way. Adam often came to school without food or money for lunch, often in the wrong uniform or in uniform that was slightly dirty, a little smelly indeed. Sometimes Adam came to school with his pyjama bottoms on under his uniform instead of underwear. His homework was rarely done on time, though when it was done, it showed real potential. It is, I think, to the great credit of Adam's school, which was an eight-form inner-city comprehensive, that they didn't respond to the presenting disruptions, but engaged with the whole child. Those responsible for transition and pastoral care and key stage, those responsible for academic and caring and management in the school, they managed to identify the individual created in the image of God, for whom Adam was not a problem, but an extraordinary reflection of his glory. And so that school found a way to treat Adam with dignity, to give him the attention that he needed, to listen to what was unsaid, as well as to the things that were quite often shouted more loudly than they would have liked. Realizing that although Adam was deeply loved by his parents, his home life was, well, perhaps could be best described as chaotic, they found ways to ensure that school was the place where he got consistency and security where he was given appropriate challenge and opportunity, clear boundaries, the place where his achievements were delighted in, the place where his unique contribution was treasured. And so the school discovered that underneath Adam's slightly odd, sometimes difficult, occasionally unsettling exterior, was a person with capacity for great compassion, loyalty and determination. They encouraged Adam to join the St. John's Ambulance. And he loved it. In his GCSE year, Adam received a public award for the remarkable way he responded when a man at the bus stop he was waiting at had a heart attack. Adam's calm, informed, confident response was instrumental in saving that man's life. Adam was commended for the dignity with which he dealt with the individual and the people around him. Educating Adam for dignity gave him a fuller life, which quite literally enabled him to bring fuller life to his community. If only all our children could be so educated for dignity. We've heard this morning that Jesus came in order that we might know life and know it in all its fullness. But if we're not respected and valued and honored, but instead diminished and dismissed and disregarded, 
by individuals or institutions, we're unlikely to be able to access that fullness of life. Educating for dignity is about individual relationships, one-to-one -one relationships between staff, between pupils, between staff and pupils, between staff and governors. But it is also about the way we shape our governance and the management of schools and the systems that we have in place. In Christ, the Bible teaches us, our human divisions are put aside. We saw earlier, in Christ there is no slave or free, no Greek or Jew, no male or female. Divisions of gender and ethnicity and economics in Christ are put aside. In Christ, the Bible teaches us, we belong to one another. In Christ, we are able to be valued and respected and honored, given opportunity and dignity. Where value is given to the weak, as well as the strong, to the poor as much as the rich, to the simple who turn out to be the wise, to the marginalized, as well as those who hold the power. In Christ, the Bible teaches, we find our true identity as children of God and are thereby enabled to recognize in one another your true identity, because you too are a treasured child of God. Which is why educating for dignity is such a deeply Christian endeavor. Because it is in Christ that we discover what it means to be given dignity and honor. A number of those this morning uh, have done our pitch uh, for the uh, organization to which we are also affiliated along with the Foundation for uh, Educational Leadership. And so I want to do my pitch for the Children's Society because the work of the Children's Society is so complementary to the work of the Foundation. And so I unashamedly commend our work to you. For example, the work of the well-being surveys that the Children's Society have undertaken over a number of years, engaging with almost 50,000 children online and face-to-face, -face, demonstrates that school is such a key factor in a child's well-being. The depth of the research that we've been able to undertake at the Children's Society would provide you and your schools with well-respected, deep, useful background research for your engagement in leadership. The Children's Society partners with schools to support their work in educating for dignity with work such as the Fair Schools Initiatives, which enables schools to work against the unintended discrimination for the poorest of our pupils. They partner with schools in work around child sexual exploration. Do please go and see my colleagues in the course of today on the stand. Because educating for dignity is rooted in the dignity that we discover as precious children of God ourselves, I want to honor you and respect your dignity as those who are following 
your vocation to leadership in Jesus' name. As a bishop, as a citizen of our nation, as a parent, I want to thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness in being obedient to the call that you have received for the sake of our children. Thank you for living out your faith in the classrooms and corridors and staff rooms and playing fields and offices of our schools and educational institutions. Thank you for your commitment and patience and ingenuity and determination. Thank you for all you do. Please be assured of my prayers as you continue to grow in your leadership for the sake of our children. Thank you.